Hey everyone, I hope you liked our video on Roswell. I thought I'd put this up as a bonus, our full, not quite unedited conversation with our friend and bandmate and genuinely just the most interesting person we know, Connor Randall, paranormal investigator. Please give him a follow on social media. Please go check out his stuff, Hellier. It is really, really cool. And if you like what you see, feel free to give us a like, a subscribe, or a follow to help us grow. Enjoy. <laughs> slate, sure. and I'll do a slate as oh, well yes, for this slate. camera. One, two, three. Cool. Okay. Uh, so Connor, to start, uh, for I mean, most <clears throat> people probably don't know you unless they're a big paranormal fan. Yeah. So could you give us like a rundown of who you are uh, and a little bit of your paranormal ghost hunting resume? Mm -hmm. My name is Connor Randall. I am a uh, paranormal investigator based out of the Denver area here. I've been fascinated with the strange and the unknown for as long as I can remember. Um, growing up, having a couple of ghostly experiences as a child sort of drove me to search for more answers. And it just sort of opened up the gateways to all of these sorts of strange things. Um, and so I'm able to sort of combine my passions for the unexplained along with uh, filmmaking and just sort of being as much of a investigative journalist as I can um, in this modern day and age. And, and so, you know, have since worked on uh, projects and appeared on shows like um, way back in the day, you know, Ghost Adventures did some work with uh, the, the local TAPS team here in Colorado from Ghost Hunters and uh, got to sort of learn a lot from those guys in the paranormal world, uh, ghost wise, and then sort of branched into aliens and the strange and the unknown and started going off on UFO hunts on my own. And, uh, then, uh, met with my friend Carl Pfeiffer and we went out recently a couple of years ago and created a project about goblins in Kentucky, uh, in caves and this whole big paranormal mystery called Hellier, uh, that's on Amazon prime and YouTube. And, and since we're just sort of non-stop making these uh, documentaries and, and documenting odd things. So for uninitiated people, like what does a paranormal investigator, like what does your job actually do? Mm -hmm. What does paranormal investigation look like? The funny thing is that a lot of, and anybody can be a paranormal investigator. There's no degree program for it. Um, there are plenty of books there's a lot of good books and there's way more bad books. And we you sort of, you <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of have to like find your way through this field. Um, if you actually want to make a living being a paranormal investigator, there's only a few ways to do it. The rarest way is you could be a TV star, but TV seems to be sort of going away in a larger sense. A lot of people write books, um, some collections of stories and talking to people, uh, some just general analysis. Uh, and then the other way is, is we're trying sort of a hybrid of that, of running different, uh, you know, websites and documentary series and things like that. And so um, I still have uh, a part time job to sort of keep a roof over my head and um, like many investigators out there, too. But in the general sense, what you're doing is trying to get to the bottom of a mystery. And it's difficult sometimes because you have to take people at their word oftentimes if you're not there in the moment yourself. And so you find the initial story and then you investigate yourself, whether that means sitting in the dark for, for a week on end um, with, with nothing happening or listening through hundreds of hours of audio files. There's a long patience game with a lot of this. And you have to recognize, are you here for an experience yourself personally, or are you here to prove things to other people? And the latter ends up being a lot more difficult oftentimes. How much do you think you're in it for yourself versus pro proving it for other people? I think I, I, most people start out convinced that they're going to be the one to go out and capture a video of a full-bodied apparition. Um, I still think that that could absolutely happen, but I am getting to a point where I am recognizing that I just love being out in the realm of high strangeness. Um, and so whatever I can do to get these stories out there. And if we catch something along the way, that's great. How do you approach that conversation? Say you're at happy hour with coworkers and I say, so Connor, what do you do for fun? Yeah. Like what's your MO there? <laughs> so, How do you present that to people? <laughs> usually the, the easiest way to say it, um, is, you know, 
the the total layman is like you know what what do you like to do and it's like oh i like to uh look for ghosts <laughs> ghosts are the most innocent of the general paranormal field um a lot of people are a lot more willing to embrace ghosts um, than they are aliens or even bigfoot which excuse me which is odd because if you think about it in the in a sense objectively what's stranger that, that we might not have found a particular species of ape or that there are extraterrestrial beings on this planet people have different answers to that and and different answers to what sasquatch even is but but alone on its face, it's easiest to talk about the ghosts because the aliens lose people pretty quickly. <laughs> I feel like everybody has their own ghost story. When I was nine, I sat my grandma or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Everybody has an aunt who has a haunted house. Yeah. Everybody has an uncle who saw something on a ranch once. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we're here to talk about Roswell. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, can you something? summarize the events of what happened near Roswell, New Mexico? in the 1940s, as you understand them. In late June, early July of 1947, a young ranch hand named Mac Brazel woke up one morning, was checking the fields, and discovered a significant debris field uh, alongside one of the areas that, that the ranch that he helped operate was, was on. And saw these this sort of strewn out, what looked like metallic looking uh, structures and clearly a major accident had occurred. He looked a little bit closer and gathered up some of the debris and material. Some people argue whether or not he saw bodies, that story changes, um, gathered up the material and took it into town. Now his ranch was actually about 85 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, it was actually closer to a town, uh, I want to say 20, 25 miles called Corona, New Mexico, a much smaller town. And he took that material into town a couple of days later, because he's a ranch hand, he's got a lot to handle. And remember, this is 1947, and this is an old rickety truck, and, and we're talking, you know, a four plus hour drive. So he had to set aside time for this. Took some of the material from that field, um, the debris field laying out on his land into town. And the first person that he walks up to in Roswell, New Mexico, which is, which is a mid-sized town, small by today's standards for sure, um, but it was a military town uh, and had, you know, a fair population, um, but a small town for sure by today's standards, brought it actually to the town sheriff, first of all. Uh, the sheriff is a guy named, named Wilcox, and he sees this and immediately says, you know, we should probably talk to the Army or the Air Force about this takes the debris field, uh, the debris from the, the, the sheriff's office and shows it um, to the military. One of the other points in question, again, because the story initially gets kind of confuddled, is whether or not they talk to the town DJ. Because the town DJ claims that he talked to them in between that, and he got a hold of the material and saw stuff before uh, the military did. And so that points up, up for debate still, but Regardless, military ends up finding out about it, and the Roswell Army Airfield uh, is, the person who oversees this project is a man named Colonel Blanchard, and Colonel Blanchard looks at this, seems to have somewhat of an idea of what might be going on, but is totally unsure, sends one of his trusted uh, deputies, a man named Major Jesse Marcel, uh, out there back with Mac to, to get back out to the debris field and sort of examine and, and see what happens. Jesse goes out to the debris field, looks at all of this, uh, gathers up more material, puts it in his truck, and then takes it back into, into Roswell. And after that happens is sort of when all hell breaks loose. He takes it back, and as he does this, the, the military sort of uh, starts to seemingly sort of freak out, um, sending large amounts of men out to that debris field, gathering up all sorts of stuff. The townsfolk all remember um, seeing these convoys going through and, and just these lines and lines of soldiers um, who were handling this sort of cleanup of whatever had occurred. And what they do is initially, uh, when asked by the local newspaper what is going on, Oddly enough, the, the Roswell, town of Roswell actually had two newspapers, which is funny for us today, because most even major cities might not even have one. But 
two newspapers. He, he talked to one of the newspaper men um, and the military is quoted as saying, we captured a flying saucer. And that headline gets printed on July 8th, 1947, that next day by, by the local Roswell newspaper. And it just blows up. It goes worldwide. It goes as viral as something can go in 1947. And everybody's talking about this. The larger context of this, of course, is put against some, some sort of historical backdrop, which we can talk about later. But the whole idea of it is like, this is insane. Then, as the cleanup is happening, the military takes a step back that next day um, with the other local newspaper and says, it, it was just, we're like, JK, we're, we're kidding. This, that was a weather balloon um, out there in the field. And so then that headline goes out and says that, no, that we, um, you know, debunked it. Don't worry about it. It's not a flying saucer. It's a weather balloon. And that seems to quell a lot of interest in the case for a long time, uh, saying that, that that is what actually happened. And that they, they went so far as to take a picture um, where Jesse is. It's one of the sort of the famous images. Even people who might not know a lot about aliens have probably seen this picture um, where he's leaning down and he's holding up debris and they sort of had a little mini press conference there and, and shows like, here it is, like it's the weather balloon, it's fine. And- Are those uh, pictures taken in Roswell? Wait, do you know taken who's, Fort Worth, right? who's house they're in? Like, they look allegedly like they, they were in, I think it was in Texas yeah. that they sent some of it to Texas and then they oh. sent Jesse out there himself. Yeah, it goes to Carcel Air Force Base, right? Ah, that sounds right. Because I think Jesse was the one who told the newspapers that we captured a flying saucer. So he had to be the face of the cleanup as well. So I think he was actually flown out to Texas. Yeah. Well, and I, I find him one of the more interesting characters in the whole thing, because he was in charge of a huge amount of intelligence in the Southwest and the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, he gave interviews into the 1980s saying, I don't know what I saw out there. Yeah. Yeah, he was never, he was a man of his, of his word in a sense. And of course, um, being nervous that, you know, your military pension or something's gonna go, who knows what, what was told to him in order to get him to sort of backtrack on that statement. Or if he legitimately thought he was mistaken, that kind of goes down in history, but he doesn't ever claim to know exactly what he saw out in that field because he was, remember the second witness, um, which is vital. Um, Mac was there initially and, and then Jesse was there right afterwards. Um, as soon as he heard out about it from, from Mac. Um, this is the definition of no man's land. I mean, it is way out there um, in the desert, let alone. And so stuff just sits there um, and had sat there. The, the, the other question is, is if something crashed, we don't exactly know what day it crashed. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So mm -hmm. one of like, I think something that people really take issue with is the fact that the date changes for when Mac finds the debris. What do you make of that? It's interesting. The I remember reading that some of the weather reports back in that area were that a big storm happened on July 4th. And he would have seemingly discovered it the morning of July 5th and then taken it in on July 6th. Um, but you're right. I've read that same thing, that the but date he, he has like changed. Week of June or something right, like that. that they're like, no, he, he spent a long time sitting on this before he took it in. Yeah. The question is, and, and honestly, I think that it's like, you have to imagine that you have to set an entire day aside in order to, to handle this. And and Mac being not the person who's interested in military personnel or something like that to begin with, he has, he's got a job to do. Um, that in my mind takes away a little bit of the hypothesis that he might've found bodies um, because you would think it would be a little bit more of an emergent immediate thing um, if there were bodies of these things laying out in the field. Um, whether that's true or not, who really knows? Uh, the point is, is that he found it had to drive four plus hours into town. And then he was planning on going back that day, but he was not allowed to go back that day. Um, he was actually held um, by, by the Air Force, uh, is my understanding, is that he was held there for a few days at least. And his sons had to come out and start to take care of the sheep and some of the animals that were out on the ranch. And what he was told in that little bunker in Roswell by the military during the, that time period that he was being held, who, who really knows?
Yeah. So I, I feel like this is where the G men, like men in black, kind of come in. It how how credible are statements that the people who held him and maybe even walked him to one of the newspapers to retract his statement about what he found? How credible do you think those are? That these are like men in dark suits with dark glasses that act funny and are implicitly aliens. Yeah, the timeline of things can get construed pretty easily. And I think until somebody has really read multiple uh, texts and accounts of ufology in its early heyday, um, it's hard to put it in context because some of the UFO, some of the men in black stuff didn't really come out until a man named Alfred K. Bender um, was sort of the initial one to to first talk about stuff like that. And he actually talked about them more in the in the spectrum of it being like almost like a magic ritual where he would manifest these beings. Excuse me. Where Alfred Bender would claim to sort of manifest these beings who would um, give out coded information, act very strangely. That gets confused um, and also has some weird like racial ties to it and stuff that is still sort of confusing with the government secrecy option. And the Will Smith film didn't help. Um, that there were two distinct entities. That if men in black exist, are they aliens? Are they government agents? Are they both? Um, does the government not even know anything about them? And they actually are extraterrestrials because allegedly they act strange. They don't fit quite right. They're missing a leg or they have something off with them where they're not quite human. Their cars are all 50 years older than they should be, things like that. It doesn't seem to me that in terms of if I had to say credibility wise that that is what happened to Mac. I think he was legitimately held by the military. Um, and the reason didn't come forward potentially until about 50 years into the future. But we'll, we'll get into that. Okay. And you mentioned how different it is in this really early element of ufology. Mm -hmm. it, uh, why do you think Roswell became so significant? Because it seems like it has all those tangential connections to a number of different events. Yeah. There are a few years in ufology, which is the study of UFOs, um, that are really important. And 1947 is one of them. Um, some of the other ones are in the late 1960s. There's 1897. Some, some various important dates happen. Flap um, days, right? Flap dates, supposedly. <laughs> that, that's in the more theoretical stuff for another video. But they're, they're, 1947 is essential to remember that um, that was the report, that was the year that Kenneth Arnold made his report. Um, Kenneth Arnold was, in a sense, the first person to really say that he saw a UFO. Um, he was a commercial uh, sort of like businessman who was a pilot on the side, um, was flying uh, near Mount Rainier. Uh, in, and it was just a couple of months, I believe, before the Roswell thing whole happened. Um, in 1947, said that he saw these nine craft um, around his plane and actually described them uh, to a newspaper reporter as looking like flying saucers. Just, and, and he sort of inadvertently coined the term. That craze set off all sorts of things because suddenly there were strange things in the sky. And people were interested in this, in this alleged report for two reasons. Number one, because it's weird and it's fun to think about these things. But back in those days, maybe not necessarily so much because we're coming fresh out of World War II. And the idea that there are foreign agents in the sky flying things over your country that you don't know what they are is, is admittedly very scary. And so that sort of starts this 1947 UFO craze. Um, different sightings are happening. People are seeing things. Uh, there is, looking at sort of the historical context text of that year, a very high number of reports in the year of 1947. And so Roswell, I think, is essential because it's the first time, and this is in July of 1947, it's the first time that the UFO phenomena starts to feel real and tangible. Because you're coming out of World War II, um, trust and, and faith in the government and the military is very high. These guys legitimately just saved the world. And suddenly the Air Force is saying, we just captured a flying saucer. Um, it seems like something is, is very real is, is happening there. So I think that's why it's so infamous and why it sort of fell, fell into the history books in that way, because it was global 
and the name is catchy. And it was the first time that people were like, whoa, finally, yeah, heck yeah, there's things in the sky. All these people aren't crazy. Something's there. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that kind of leads into our next question. Do you feel like there's a difference between how ufologists or paranormal investigators such as yourself understand Roswell and the average hobbyist or like a person who's just kind of familiar with it from like a pop culture sense? Mm -hmm. I think that in a lot of ways, Roswell is, um, for lack of a better term, Roswell is the, the gateway drug. Um, it starts out innocently enough. <laughs> you're sitting there and you're interested in this like, oh yeah, Roswell. I mean, let's, let's watch a little history channel program about that. And then suddenly it sparks an interest in some people and they start diving further and further. And then before you know it, Roswell opens up the whole world of aliens and UFOs to, to the casual um, viewer in a sense. Um, because it's so infamous, everybody gets it. Something crashed in the desert. It has that American West appeal um, that, that a lot of people out there, you know, out East are sort of like searching for that cowboy yearning feeling too. It hits so many markers for just a prime front page story. And so anyway, th I think that it's different because when people initially start looking into it, they're like, oh yeah, Roswell, because it seems easy enough to understand. And before you know it, you're reading about uh, George Adamski and Van Tassel and UFO cults of the 1970s and then and then diving further and further into this. So um, it, it's what I would call the greatest hits. Um, it's the one hit wonder of, of the UFO world where people who are really into it recognize that the general public doesn't know the full discography, but it's the first song that people hear about. Yeah, it's on classic rock radio. <laughs> it's on yeah. classic rock radio. <laughs> well, and you've obviously read a number of books on there. We've got a couple of them right in front of us here. Mm -hmm. Can you give us like the greatest hits to continue with the, the music metaphor and the, the flops? Yeah. The Philip J. Corsos and the whole thing. <laughs> I was, that was probably going to be my bad example. That's like, actually, they compare well. I think if uh, for further reading, a book that I would really recommend is one called The uh, Witness to Roswell, um, which was put together and it's just a few years old. And it is a wonderful, compelling text of legitimate eyewitness accounts um, where the authors talked with people in that town who are now aging um, with military personnel, with everybody from, you know, the town like coroner and people who are running the mortician's office to, um, you know, the sons of the sheriff and uh, you know, family members of various key players. And it's a really nice look at the way people remember that insanity of 1947. So Witness to Roswell is, is a really good text to understand the full length of the story in, in our modern day and age. And a text that I necessarily wouldn't recommend, and I, and I feel bad because you don't want to necessarily like soil somebody's name if they're legitimate, but, it, but the reality is, is that we have to take it with a pinch of salt. There's a book called The Day After Roswell, which is by uh, Colonel Philip J. Corso. Now, Philip Corso was a legitimate colonel um, in the army who also worked in the, in the White House in the 1960s, um, has a really nice resume. He released this book in the mid-1990s that said, essentially, The Day After Roswell was about how he was a part of these covert government programs that took the the sort of the crafts of UFOs and took different parts and pieces from them and reverse engineered them to create things like uh, fiber optics and integrated circuits and lasers and these things that we use in our daily lives and saying that we we got a lot of those origins from alien and extraterrestrial technology. Phil Corso wrote this book and it came out, the man who actually wrote the foreword to a book was a, was a former senator who was a friend of, of Corso's. And after the book came out, the, the senator retracted his statement saying like, I didn't know that the, I thought this was going to be more of like a memoir of like his career. I didn't think it was going to be about this. I don't know of anything about this, which of course only adds to the further mystery and secrecy of it all. Um, here's the problem. You have to, when you're looking at cases this old, and that's why it's so exciting to be in the field now, because there's there's things like that like that out there happening. So 
get out there in the moment. But when you're looking at these famous past cases, you have to realize that it's a lot better to hear from 60 witnesses than it is to just hear from one man um, in the military who maybe was told to say that. Maybe you could get really conspiratorial with it very quickly. But it's really nice to hear from the people in witness to Roswell from the people who were in the bar that Mac allegedly stopped at on his way back into town while he still had the material in his truck, things like that. Eyewitness testimony is infamously unreliable, but 65 people's eyewitness testimony plus is a lot better than, than just one man. I love that answer. Okay. So I, I want to ask about like the criticism of that. So I'll, online and in the stuff that I've read, there's a lot of criticism that you can't take anybody's word for anything. Like it's all, it's all worthless because it was buried in 1947 after, like you said, the army said, nope, it's just a weather balloon and everyone believed it. And that it was, I mean, like 20, 30, 40 years later mm -hmm. that people started to kind of go back and like reignite some interest in that. Yeah. Like what's your take on that? Does that devalue people's testimony does are you a little skeptical if people were asked about something 40 years after it happened like it doesn't that kind of dull the senses dull the memory a little bit it's a double-edged sword um on one hand and and of course being a believer myself i'm more i i i want to believe right that that the famous x-files slogan i want to see yeah i want to, I want to go back and and see i want these people to to be telling the truth about what they saw and heard and, and to have reliable eyewitness testimony. But then that's part of the term, paranormal investigator. If you put your investigator cap on, you have to realize that, that um, people have a hard time remembering something 45 years um, in the future. And when somebody approaches you and says, I'm a producer for the UFO show on the travel channel, will you talk to us about Roswell? that could also affect your memory as well. If, if your own egocentric memory, subconscious or not, starts to get in there. Um, having full on nondescript eyewitness testimony is a rare thing these days. Here's why I think though, on the other side of the coin, here's why I think that these people really did stay quiet for such a long time. Um, you have to sort of realize that coming out of, of World War II, these people really trusted the military, trusted everything that they said. When they said it was a weather balloon, they probably were like, okay, that sort of shuts my mind off about it as well. And maybe not until later when time goes on, um, you could argue if you want to get really sociological with it, some faith in the military and stuff like that in regards to like Vietnam and era and, and 20 years later starts to potentially falter a little bit compared to that World War II crowd. Not that anybody you know, did anything wrong, who was actually in service. And, but regardless, the whole thing is, af as that sort of trust derailed, some of the actual events maybe came forward. Um, and with the resurgence of the 50th anniversary, which just has so happened to be while, while Bill Clinton was in office, um, who was an alleged UFO fan himself. Yeah, Hillary Clinton's a big UFO fan yeah. too. On the campaign trail, I feel like she promised to release some stuff. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, boy, okay. <laughs> that was it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, that sort of spurred on, no, let's tell the truth about what happened way back when. Um, because the line of questioning didn't occur back in the 1940s. And the amount of military response seemed incredibly unreasonable um, in regards to it just being a weather balloon. And as people sort of simmer on that, and as you get multiple people, the, the other factor I think in this is that as people age, yes, their memory goes away, but they're also more likely to tell you how things really were, right? Um, and once the uh, people could, conspiracy theorists would argue that once that military pension is being threatened, well, when you're 90 years old and on your deathbed, you're not so afraid of that anymore. And and the truth starts to come out. Well, and, you know, we clearly have like the, there's a huge gap of time, but we also have the government response, as yeah. you mentioned. Uh, and then, but you would also have these people that 
argue it is the most thoroughly debunked UFO situation that's right. ever existed. Do you have a personal take on it? Yeah, what do you honestly believe? Allegedly, what happens, according to the military, um, way in the future, we're zooming into the you know 80s, 90s now, apparently what crashed in the field in Roswell was a large-scale device that was part of something called Project Mogul. Um, Project Mogul was something that they were never going to tell people about way back when um, because it was incredibly top secret. This is the high-altitude balloons for radio for yeah. radioactivity. Right? And it's this device. They actually released some pictures of sort of what it looked like. So you can find those online as well of this sort of string of different things that were went way up into sort of the stratosphere and they were listening for seismic activity to see if the Soviets were also going to launch an atomic bomb. And that's the sort of thing that you will never hear about um, in the moment, right? Uh, while we're at the threat of being bombed by, by um, the Soviets. And so you, they come forward and say, actually, what crashed was this. It wasn't a weather balloon. It wasn't this. Um, that answer has to be met with certain questions as well. Um, number one, you have to be a little bit appreciative of a potential real answer from the government. But number two, you have to sit back and be like, hold on. If we accept this, we also have to accept the fact that the military lies to us knowingly, right? So once a friend lies to you once, why would you ever think, well, they're never going to do that to me again, right? Um, that that sort of could continuously keep occurring. Um, and so they made up a story once. Why not make up a story twice, of course, is the counter argument. But I will admit that when you look at things like um, the U-2 spy plane that they didn't tell people about, and, and that was, you know, out there in the deserts of Nevada um, up north as well, and came forward and say, no, this is it. I don't think it's ridiculous to think that the military is ahead of us technology-wise up in the sky. But... I don't think that they know what is going on with aliens and UFOs. And there's either two, there's either two answers. Either they, and, and I heard this from John Tenney, either they don't know what's going on and they don't want us to know, or they know what's going on and they don't want us to know. And both of those are equally scary in their own right. Um, personally, I think that something of extraterrestrial origin crashed in, in the field in Roswell, New Mexico. I don't think that there were bodies. Yeah, before you go on, I wanted to ask, why do people think there were bodies? Because I'm not done with my research for this video mm -hmm. yet, but so far I have found zero testimony that says Mac found bodies. I've heard other people say they heard other folks. The Ballard family funeral yeah. and all. But, right. But, that they made child-sized caskets and yeah. things like that for these things. But nobody's saying Mac did. Right. So, a lot, so and I, I'm kind of with you on this, where, 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 where did the traditional context that's now all over the town of Roswell, New Mexico, come of these little green men, right, of these, of these beings? Um, it's my understanding that the people who are picking up the debris field, the army men who linked arm in arm, um, apparently reported, and this is also in Witness to Roswell, a couple of them said that they might have seen some bodies and that that is what was taken to the infamous hangar, um, which I believe was hangar 84 um, in Roswell. We've got a picture from... Uh, yeah, from nice. <laughs> it's either hangar 18 or like 84. I might be being dyslexic about it, but they allegedly had these bodies there. And then multiple people came forward claiming that they examined the bodies, that they did this, that this, that this. But I will admit that I think you're correct, that I don't think Mac ever claimed to find bodies. Um, but as he was being held, and then he never wanted to talk about it again. Um, how would we really exactly know what he saw? Uh, the other cool thing that's interesting to me about it is that if people did find bodies, again, incredibly high conjecture here, but that traditional being of sort of the smaller, large head, large eyes, um, those are greys. And as you get into more alien stuff, um, greys have that distinct look and they're not the friendliest and it's a whole other can of worms. But why is the classic story green? 
I don't know. You could argue that maybe bodies being out in the desert sun for two weeks might discolor things. Um, but you're going on the record saying you think it was extraterrestrial or <laughs> military? I will go on the record and say that I think that... Hmm. Here's why I think that it might... Here's why 65% of my brain is leading towards it being ex extraterrestrial. There's a hypothesis called um, the the zoo hypothesis or the um, or the laboratory hypothesis. There's a Twilight Zone episode about this, right? <laughs> I think there <laughs> might be that there's that there's something up uh, that there's a higher intelligence, and and I'm religious as well. I'm talking uh, higher intelligence species who are examining us, whether Earth is being some sort of a laboratory or something like that. I find it incredibly coincidental that the place that this happened at was Roswell Army Airfield Base. And the reason being is because that is where the Enola Gay was stationed. The Enola Gay was the plane that uh, famously dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You could, a lot of, you know, people who are deeper into the more conspiratorial nature than I am uh, say that uh, when a major human event like that happens, if that theory is correct, it triggered something out there that something occurred and these higher intelligence species are naturally going to come check on these things. The reason that I believe that Roswell may be extraterrestrial is because it co-aligns with so many other stories of UFOs and strange sightings around military craft, around Air Force car you know, carriers out there in the open ocean, um, around uh, nuclear war bunkers and sightings and stuff like that. UFOs appear around military stuff all the time. And there's so many stories that have gone down in history where it doesn't seem incredibly far-fetched for me to say, yeah, they were checking out, you know, where the atomic bomb came from on this huge Roswell Army airfield back then as well. So when you put it into the larger context, of UFO lore and recognizing, you know, that some of these incidents um, occur around uh, seemingly these military technologies. And even now, these days, more and more stuff is coming out. I don't dive into that side of UFO necessarily stuff as much because you have to sort of inherently trust what the government is telling you. But I will say that I believe 65% that it was extraterrestrial. And the other side of it is that Project Mogul was the actual explanation. I think that the viewers I would encourage before they sort of take a step back and be like, no, that makes perfect sense to look at the larger wide spectrum of the way UFO case history has worked and, and realizing that um, somebody seems to be watching the weapons and things in power. Well, that's a great lead into our next question. Just as a general paranormal researcher, is that what Roswell means to you on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm. Or, uh, you know, give us the grand picture there. <clears throat> Roswell is the, the greatest hits. It's the first, you know, main hit song that a lot of people initially learn about and read about. And it's the same for me too. And then, as you start to question more and more, not only what's true or not in regards to alien and UFO witnesses, but also the government itself, Roswell keeps ringing true to that. And the mystery that surrounds it is palpable and carries on to this day. And that legacy doesn't seem to be really met with, with any other UFO case. And I think it's a beautiful story um, whether it is just a military cover-up or not, it's a beautiful story of a town embracing its strangeness. And I think if more towns and more people around America embraced sort of these odd legends and stories that our collective minds would open up a little bit more and, and some that I truly believe is out there would, would be able to come through more clearly. <laughs> so we we all went to Roswell together in 2015 mm -hmm. with our friend Tim. Uh, what was your favorite part about that trip? Your big takeaways? Yeah, stuff like that. In our visit to Roswell, uh, I 
set up a, a tour with a man named Dennis Balthasar, who I don't believe is giving those tours anymore, but he was able to actually take us uh, in his car and drive us around to all these key players' homes. I think that my favorite part of that trip was actually being close to the action and where it took place. Um, you actually got to see, uh, you know, we, we sat outside and he pointed out the window because it's a small town. Well, that's where Jesse Marcel lived. If he took material home and drove home from Mac Brazel's ranch that night, he took it allegedly into his house. Even his son has sometimes said, yes, he felt some of the material as well. Potentially extraterrestrial craft stuff was in that little home, that, that little home. And, and just it being right in front of you, being so close, um, sort of brings the whole story to light. And you're able to sort of contextualize it better than it just being this place of lore. Because it's a town. Um, it's an operating town, just like any other town in America. But it's a town that captured worldwide interest in 1947. And more people are still trying to figure out the mystery today. Whether the government is telling us the truth or not, I think at this point doesn't really matter. Because all that it really sort of represents now is a place that has embraced its strangeness. Um, seeing Roswell and how the McDonald's has a big UFO statue on it and how you go into the Walmart and they sell all sorts of alien merch. Towns that embrace the odd things about them. The only two that I can really think of in America that I've seen are Roswell, New Mexico and Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And um, when they do that, I think it's a really beautiful thing of a little bit of quirky history that sparks enough interest and allows what's actually out there, I think, to come through a little more clearly to the general populace. I love that. Um, so, like I said, I wanna try to put all of this together as like a bonus on our channel. So I figure people who have watched this far are, well, might go a little further. Do you wanna plug anything? Uh, like stuff you're working on, stuff people should watch if they wanna check out more? Yeah, I. Uh, if you guys wanna check out um, Basically, the, the whole Planet Weird universe is where I'm living now. Um, so if you have gotten this far and, and haven't seen Hellier, please check out Hellier. That is our H-E-L-L-I-E-R. That's our main flagship project that we're working on. And we have two other documentaries in the works that um, will be coming out um, fairly soon as well. So upon this release, I, I think um, if they find me online at Connor J. Randall, um, Instagram or Twitter, I, I think we may be uh, talking about what those other projects are and, and really excited to continue to share strange stories and appreciate the opportunity. Hell yeah. And then this is solely for the, all the people on the Hellier subreddit. Hellier 3 is happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, the, if the phenomenon wants it to happen, uh, it'll happen and it seems to be leaning that, that it might that it might want to happen. So, they're, so they're we're, read way too much. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we've talked about how we, uh, we are putting, we are putting casework together, but had, had to be stalled because we couldn't travel. Um, you heard it here. <laughs> so we're working. It's a, uh, it's a continuing effort and, uh, still a lot to learn. Still a lot to learn. I love it. Thanks, Connor. Thank, Thank you. you.